take a trip with me to 1913. I'm speaking with Enoch Kent, who's just released a new album of songs called Take a Trip with Me. I thought folks might be interested in getting a bit of background first. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that just starts with what got you interested in this music in the first place, and singing. The answer to the singing part was almost answered by a child of four on TV with Martin Mull, who <laughs> questioned this little girl who had just sung a song beautifully. Uh -huh. And he says to her, how long have you been singing? And she said, all my life. <laughs> <laughs> She's four. Right, right. <laughs> well, everybody in the family sang, my sister sang. My dad played the concertina and he was in what was called the last of the concertina bands. And it was a big band. It was about this long, yeah. hung in the bathroom, a place of honor for my yeah. dad. And my, my dad's one of these wee figures in yeah. this group, right. in the concertina. Yeah. He could read music, which fascinated me because I didn't know anyone that could read music except right. my dad. Uh -huh. And um, he played the concertina, and we'd all elbow one another to sing our song, play my song, Dad, was the way it was done. Right. And we had a kitchen sink there, and a counter there, and mm -hmm. a bread box here. Uh -huh. And it, when dinner was over and dishes were washed, there was a drape that was pulled over, so the kitchen sink it was just one big room. The kitchen was the room. It was a room and kitchen was the name of the house or the, 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 the flat. Right. So that was pulled open, and we'd step on top of this pool, the drape shot. My dad said, introduce us. <laughs> the only audience we had was my mother sitting right. there, who was really fascinated because she was always knitting when I was singing. <laughs> So I was giving it my all, my dad would play. And it, we progressed from that. My sister sang pop songs. There was a, a, a cheap uh, book, it just gave words. Uh -huh. But my dad would go out and buy the music so he could right. accompany them. So I, and I wanted in on that as well. Right. And then we moved from that to Scottish songs. I didn't know they were folk songs. And they some were just weren't. Scottish songs. They were just Scottish songs. Yeah, right. I mean, I didn't even know the phrase folk song. Right. So uh, they were folk songs as it turned out later on. And my dad had uh, collected them when he was, or learned them when he was young. Then I went to hear Ewan McCall sing. Yeah. He came up to sing to a group that was called the Workers' Music Association. And they published a book called Scotland Sings, compiled by Ewan. Mm -hmm. My dad bought it for me. And so I had that book. We both uh, had political avenues that we took, and one was the campaign for nuclear disarmament, the other one was with anti-apartheid. But the CND uh, taught me something about uh, various other people, mainly church people. Uh, look, I, have, I, I don't like religion at all. It's not a question that I'm not religious, I just don't like it. I don't trust it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I met a lot of church people that were really great in the, when they had a cause like uh, stopping, killing one another. It's, disarmament movement. Yeah, disarmament movement. It was really strong. And some people were disobeying the head of their churches. Mm -hmm. uh, the Church of England, the guys there, and were being chastised for joining in or going out and speaking publicly. What was the mood like in London at that time? For, I, I mean, amongst the singers. Amongst, oh, amongst the, the singers, there was uh, the people who did not agree with what we were doing. Everyone assumes that folk singers are socialists, and they're not. There's mm -hmm. many, there are many are not. You know? There's lots of uh, singers who were, in fact, uh, sympathetic. And they would turn up and sing. Everyone was sang for free. I don't remember uh, getting paid much at all. It was all for causes. We were raising money for things all mm. the time. You know? Do you think the time, not only in, uh, in London, but perhaps here in North America too, uh, was a time that brought people who didn't necessarily come from socialist backgrounds. That's right. The music brought them you're to right. another understanding of the social condition. That's a good point because that, that this was pre-Vietnam and right. Vietnam happened the same way. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bob Dylan was not really, he started out, I thought, as a protest singer, but he drifted off to become a poet rather than a, mm -hmm. but in his work at the beginning and the following, Phil Ox, mm -hmm. definitely, yeah. and what remained of the older singer, like Woody Guthrie's songs were still around. These songs brought people together because they made sense. Mm -hmm. my, I used to ask my father, why are you in the trade union? And he'd say, well, and this came from his Christian background. He judged everything on a basis of what was fair and what was not. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, it was quite clear to me by the time I got educated at school, 
But I also get educated at the kitchen table listening to my dad. Right. Just getting to the new album for a second. Take a trip with me. Yeah. That's Woody Guthrie. Where, where are you going to take us on this trip? Well, it's, it, I, I, the trip is it's where you have the most fun in yeah. your mind. Mm -hmm. So it's your imagination. I'm asking you to do what Woody Guthrie did in that song, uh, the 1913 Massacre. Right. That's the line, first line of the songs. take a trip take with me right. to 1913. Now, he wrote that in 1940. And he's saying, come back with me to 1913. And then he describes this horrible crime by uh, scabs and company thugs and 73 children being killed, smothered on a stair. Right. It's horrible. Yeah. And he, it, but he paints that picture so well that that picture stayed in my mind. I knew that song when I was quite young in mm -hmm. Scotland. Mm -hmm. And I thought, every song I sing and write, I have a picture in mind. If I could paint, I could, I could paint a picture of traditional ballads. Cause the, the, when I start to sing, a picture comes to I start to sing the Bleacher Lassie or Kelvin Hall. The Kelvin Hall in Glasgow comes to mind. In my, I mean, I see it right now. As soon as I just said it, I see right, the picture see of it. It's in my mind. So I'm asking people, do the same. I'm not saying think my way. You've got to think your own way. Sure. It's, it's your imagination. It's your imagination that counts. Mm -hmm. So every song that I tried to put in it, it has something to do with uh, either something you think is fair or it's not fair. I'm back to where my training is and that comes from situations or conditions really right. and it's always about fellow workers my equal I don't sing up to anybody and I don't sing down yeah. to anybody I sing eye to eye and the other uh, song you might even say about union busting is uh, Ginger Goodwin the murder of Ginger Goodwin yeah in the Cumberland Cemetery stands a memorial stone to a man who fought for others and It's a very strong Canadian story and very few Canadians know. It took place, you might know, in uh, the coal fields in uh, Vancouver Island. And, and near Courtney, there's a Cumberland coal mines over there. There's a massive coal mines over there. So I was singing there and a man called Brian Charlton took me to this uh, graveyard. Mm -hmm. And it's not your normal graveyard, there's, not, there's no statues or vaults or anything. Like, like mausoleums. Nothing, no <laughs> mausoleums. The stones were about this size and they're hand carved by fellow miners for their mates who died. Right. Mainly in the mines. There's a bit of a division there. The Catholics have their own wee bit there and the right. other guys are over here. That's religion again. Again. So they, they divide them up. That's, that's the way to rule. Divide yeah. them up. <laughs> so they, they, they chipped out the guy's name right. on the day of his death. There was one about that size, and then he told me this was Ginger Goodwin. Now, Ginger Goodwin was a, and I got a book on the subject at the coal mining museum there. The story just grabbed me, the fact that this guy, his only crime, or two crimes in those days, he was a conscientious objector. He did not want to go and kill fellow workers in other countries. Mm -hmm. That was his way. And that came from a background, I think, from someone who had, I think, was a Marxist that he had listened to. So he was using Marxist phrases. Mm -hmm. So he was a conscientious objector. But and that a was commie. probably <laughs> or possibly, <laughs> yeah, if, right. there, if there had been a party, he would have joined. I right. think. Yeah, right. right. He could not claim conscientious objection to the war because the only way you could claim it was if you had a religious reason for not going to war. Mm -hmm. Anyone else who was a pacifist, that didn't count. Right. It, you know, it's still hard to do, seemingly. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was against them. Uh, he tried to start a union. That was against them. So the mine, the mine owners fired him. So he joined another uh, a metal working company. And he started a union there, and they were accepted as a union. So he became, he became such a good speaker and a good guy that he was asked to stand uh, for the legislature in, uh, in British Columbia. Because they sent a guy out to bring him in because he was a conscientious objector. The guy went out with a hunting rifle, not a service revolver, right. killed him. Uh -huh. And every year there's a long line, leaves Courtney and Cumberland, and goes to the, that, that stone this size, it's in the graveyard, that's Ginger Goodwin's headstone. Every year, the whole town, marches to this. It's so moving. Uh, one of the other songs on, on the album, just uh, sort of moving away from the Union theme for a second, 
um, that really struck, struck me is the pawn shop window. shop down on Chuff Street's a picture of delight with gleaming gold and jewelry that gets locked away each night each object has a value and each a ticketed price and each piece has a story of someone else's life oh, I know you've got a story about pawn shops and, uh, you know, where they fit. They still fit. I, indeed, but I, you know. They're very, they're, they're very uncomfortable yeah. to most people. Yeah. And most people, if they've ever used a pawn shop, won't admit it. Mm -hmm. But we're living in a, a society where fashion rules almost everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, not just clothing and hair, but uh, the kind of cars, the kind of topics, where we live, uh, and who our friends are, you know, and most people don't want to say that they've, they were hard up, so hard up they had to go and pawn something. Mm -hmm. But the history of the pawn shops, in, especially in Great Britain, they're still going strong. It was so important to women to keep households going because men never told them how much they, not all men, but many men never told them how much money they earned. So the women had to run the house then she'd have a number of children. He wouldn't give them any more money. So they, get, they were running on nothing. So the right. pawn shop uh, was basically their method of making ends meet. And it was so important to life, again, fashion. People would pawn their good clothes, and take them out on a Saturday, wear them on Sunday to church to show that they were conservative, decent people, right. then pawn them again on the Monday. Really? That was that was it. The biggest piece of business in uh, in certainly in London, but m almost all of the English pawn shops, was for two weeks after Queen Victoria died, because everybody took their good clothes out and put, wore them to show that they were in mourning for. She was a popular monarch. Yeah, she was. Yeah, and right. uh, so they were showing sign of respect. Sign of respect. Yeah. So they walked around with their good togs on for a couple of weeks to show that they loved the Queen. And that was a big boom and uh, And then possibly pawn them again. Oh absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. A store owner sat in his great big store. On his cheek was a sentimental tear. As he started to sing a Christmas song, the one he sings each and every year. I worked at Oxford Circus on uh, a uh, very posh street from there is Bond Street big shops, fashion shops. All, all the big fashion And they, every Christmas, Bond Street decorations are big. It's pouring rain. I'm walking from the subway up to where my studio is. I work, I've got, I share a studio with two other guys, two really good guys. And I'm walking up Bond Street and the guy has designed Bond Street and he's across the street, he's, I'm saying he, I don't even know if it was a man or a woman, suspended these angels and they look, it's, it's a plastic, but it looks like parchment, you know, it's semi-translucent. Oh, yeah. These angels are like this, just, they spread out across. Over Bond Street. Over Bond Street. <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful, but it's pouring rain and the rain is getting into these angels. So the bellies of the angels are getting bigger as the, as the rain's coming down. And there's a guy coming along. This is, I'm standing laughing to myself in Bond Street. This guy comes along with a great long pole with a nail on the end of it and he pokes it into the angel. So there's a big fat angel peeing on Bond Street. <laughs> and that just struck me as being ridiculous. And then I thought about the whole commercialization, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Every one of those songs brought a picture to my mind that made me think, geez, that's really great. And then I'd learn the song. I wasn't conscious that I was going to do this yeah. until it all came together. I've got enough now to say what I want to say. Take a trip with me. Yeah. Take a trip with me to 1913. To Callum, Michigan, and the Copper.